was here in the city, but that precludes me being able to be here. When Sister Lehman heard I was going to do that, so would you please speak for me Friday morning? And I'm like, Saturday morning, I'm like, is it Friday? Yeah, it's Friday. Friday morning, yeah. And I said yes, because I had Friday morning open. And so here I am, in Jesus' name. I'd like to talk to you today about an old subject that hopefully somebody can get a hold of in a new way. And that is amazing grace. Would you say that with me? Amazing grace. I was in Tupelo right after general conference. I rented a car and drove down to my parents' They were superintendent of the Tupelo Children's Mansion for 16 years, and I grew up there and uh, went to see them. And Edna came over to see me. Edna and her three sisters were the first mansion girls. Their mother had died in childbirth with Faye, who was my age. And when the UPCI opened the mansion, those were the first four little girls at the mansion. And we played together. We had a lot of fun. Patsy came over to see me, and it was great reminiscing about old times. But as I was driving from Nashville, or from Tupelo, back to Nashville to catch the plane, the Holy Ghost spoke to me in the car. I was very exhausted from ministering to my parents and general conference and a lot of counseling and just driving along, zoning out. And the Lord spoke to me about this meeting today and told me to speak this message. And when he did, I was like, wow, I'll start it out with Edna. It's a good place to start with Edna. Now, Edna's older than me. She's 75 now, and I'm 64, so she's older than me. I was six years old when I got the Holy Ghost. I was so thrilled to have the Holy Ghost because I'd been seeking it for two and a half years. My Lord, and I was a faithful seeker. I was in that altar just crying and begging, and man, I was worn out from trying to get the Holy Ghost. So when I got it, I was thrilled to death, and uh, I couldn't, I was just so excited. My daddy danced that night, my German daddy who had never danced in the spirit. It was just a wonderful night. I, I was basically relieved because I knew now that I was not going to go to hell. I thought I wasn't going to go to hell. But anyway, I went in the bathroom and uh, Edna came in. Now, Edna being about 11 years older, if I'm sick, she's like 17 by now. I'm telling her, she's standing there and I'm, Edna, I got the Holy Ghost. She said, really? I said, yeah. She said, well, now you're going to have to be good like the rest of us. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh my Lord, here I just got this Holy Ghost I've been trying to get for two and a half years. And now all of a sudden I got to try to be good. And as soon as she said that, young though I was, Satan began to put me on a walk with God, which was not the will of God. Everybody say, not the will of God. Not say, not the way to do it, Sister Walker. Not just her influence, but that's one thing that started me. A lot of other influences in my life. But my young years of living for God, I felt like I was walking on a tightrope. I knew righteousness was right, right? We're supposed to be righteous, but I'm young and I'm ignorant. So I think righteousness means being right, looking right, talking right, thinking right, all those right things. And that exhausted me. Edna's right. It was exhausting to always try to be righteous. And so I'm on the tightrope, and I would imagine that I, I would try to be good, and I wouldn't get mad at my brother, and I wouldn't sass my mom, and I wouldn't get mad at a mansion kid, and I'm doing good, and I'm doing good. But down there's hell, and I would imagine that the trumpet was going to blow, and as soon as the trumpet blew, I would lose it. I would mess up my good plan, and I would do something wrong, and boom, hell bound. Now that is a horrible way to live. But I live that way, not just as a six-year-old, I live that way for a long time. Back in Tupelo, one of the songs we sang, Donna and I laughed. One time I went to Virginia with her, and we did Mother's Memorial Banquets all over the state of Virginia. She drove, and I rode and laughed. I said, Donna, I laugh five hours a day with you, or six, and then I have to get up and preach. What, what's about that? You know, we're not being carnal here, but we were reliving old times and just laughing our heads off and having a good time. And one of the things we talked about were the songs we used to sing. Boy, did we have the songs. Man, believe you me, they were not like what we sing now. And uh, one of them was, it was a regular, sin can never enter there. This is a worship song. Sin can never enter there. All within its gates are pure, and from defilement we're kept secure. But sin can never enter there. And as soon as they said sin, I could just thought they were pointing at me. But I kept trying. I'm trying to be right, do right, look right, act right, think right. I'm trying really, really hard to please my God. But my God was very hard to please. I had a German daddy, type A. Thank God for all the benefits of that. But there's some mix to it too. 
Uh, I'm in the fifth grade. I bring home a report card, and my report card has all A's except for math, and there's a B in the math. And Daddy brags. He says, wow, all A's. Look at all these A's, sweetheart. You're doing so well. But what about this B? Couldn't we bring that up? And my little girl's heart was just like, oh, only perfect pleases Father. So if you translate that to your God, though you love him, though you honor him, the majority of the time, I imagine he was leaning over the balcony of heaven watching me, he and the angels. Pitiful. Can you believe that child? I don't know. I just think it's hopeless. I mean, I honestly did. My God, most of the time, had a frown on his face when he looked at me. My greatest fear in life, obviously, was then I would miss the rapture. Anybody ever been going to miss the rapture? When I was little, I'd wake up, and I'd, I'd think, and I didn't have heart trouble then, but I'd, I'd have heart trouble about the rapture. My little heart would... And I would get up and I would run into the bedroom. And if I saw two lumps in mom and dad's bed, whew, good, we're in. Hallelujah. Whew, thank you, Jesus. You didn't come yet. And I'd go repent and go back to sleep. I'm not exaggerating to make you laugh. This is how I lived. And in traveling this country, I thought it was because I'm 64 and old and another whole generation. I found out, Sister Christy, that the devil is still the devil. And he is still subtle. And it is still his job to try to twist the minds and the hearts and the spirits of God's beautiful daughters. And convince them that living for God is absolutely exhausting. And that you may not be able to do it. And after all you're trying, you might not make it anyway. That is a lie from the pit of hell that I want to dispel today. I want to tell you who you are. I want you to stand up in God and realize the power you have. I want you to stand up and realize you have power over every lying spirit of the devil. We are not weak. So the end time is bad. It's bad and it's getting worse. But you know what? What I read in this book is that in the end time, God's people are going to be strong and we're going to do exploits. That's what I read and that's what I'm going to believe. But in order for us to go forward... We've got to dispel and get rid of any garbage in our spirits or our minds or our emotions or our bodies or anything that has to do with something that does not agree with what this holy, holy word of God says. We have times that some going slow, so I'll tell you how bad it was. I went to youth camp when I was 11 years old. wasn't supposed to go till I was 12, but I was almost 12. And so the guy at the youth camp told dad I could come a few months early. I was so glad to be there. I couldn't wear heels yet, but I had these little kind of, sort of like these, like that. And I felt so good. I had little anklets on and, you know, just looking kind of dressed up. I had a little grown-up hairdo like the teenage girls. And I was thrilled to be there. First time to be away from home for five nights in a row. Well, it turned out to be four nights. But anyway, I, I was big enough. I can do this. And we'd go to the concession stand, we'd get hot dogs, we'd get pizza after church, and we'd worship in the altar, and I'd hang with the big girls, and they looked so pretty, and some of them had boyfriends, which I wasn't into yet, but I thought, oh, someday, isn't that cool? And I'm just, you know, just getting in the zone, getting ready for that teenage stuff, you know. I made it fine till Thursday night. On Thursday night, the evangelist, who was as big, nothing against whatever, but he was as big as this pulpit. He was huge. He had huge lungs. And he turned his mic up as loud as it would go and announced his sermon. Tonight, I'm going to take you on a tour through hell. <laughs> now, let me preface this by saying hell is real. Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else in scripture. And I could go there if I decide to. But it will be my decision. And I'll have to walk past the grace and the mercy and the blood and the forbearance and the long suffering of Jesus for a long time to get there. I don't want you to think I don't believe in hell. There's some wacko doctrines out there about that. But anyway, uh, 
he's preaching now. He's, he's very graphic. He's an incredible storyteller. And he has us hanging over this edge of this deep, deep precipice. And our fingernails are clawing, trying to hold on. It's very hot. It's very slimy. And the, the pit of hell is down there. And the flames are coming up. And we're all holding on. And we're trying to barely make it. Which was my concept of living for God anyway. Hanging on by the hair of my chinny chin chin. And we're barely trying to make it. And sure enough, in, in his sermon, it happens. We all, for some reason, only God knows what the reason was. But we all miss the rapture. And we're all like, Oh, plummeting down into hell. Well, I'm terrified. We go in the hell, and he goes, takes us all in this one room, and there's in there, there's Pilate and Pilate's wife, and she's got fingernails, he said, that were that long. It was amazing. I remember thinking, wow, that's amazing. And then he explained to us why. Because in hell, there are no fingernail clippers. There's nothing in hell but the devil and you. And I'd never thanked God for fingernail clippers, but I always clip my nails, toenails and fingernails on Saturday night. And I would sit down the next Saturday going, thank you, Lord. for So, so you can get something good out of every scary sermon. But anyway, he was preaching and we're down in hell and she's clawing Pilate's chest going, hell, we're in hell and it's all your fault. And I'm thinking if he would just quit preaching. I would get in that altar and I would repent more than I've ever repented, God. I would get my heart so right with you, but I'm too proud to go up there all by myself. So I want him to quit preaching. I don't want to go in the middle of the sermon. And so finally he's preaching and preaching and preaching. And, and, he, and then he starts in Revelation. My Lord, that was another hour. He went from the beginning of Revelation. Every beast that could come out of every sea came out. Every horn that could come out came out. Every, it was just terrifying. But he finally got done. And extended his altar call. And I was the first one. I remember I came right up under this pulpit. I was sliding in. By the time I got done. There were children on top of me. Bodies on top of me. We're just. We're piled everywhere. We're praying. We're repenting. We're begging. Oh God. I don't want to go to hell. Please forgive me for anything and everything. And I'll do anything. And now there's nothing wrong with repenting. And we do need to repent. But I'm going to tell you how bad my fear was. We're talking here a stronghold of fear. Everybody say a stronghold. Everybody, we're all scared sometimes. I had a strong hold of fear in my life concerning my relationship with God. So it's all over. The moon, by the way, had turned to blood during that sermon, of course, <laughs> as everything else had happened. So we get to the dorm, and I've repented. I talked in tongues. I heard myself. And I used to think it was like oil in the car that if you pull it up and saw you, know, you speak in tongues, you're rapture ready. I'm like, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Just keep talking in tongues, and then if he comes, I'll go. Sort of my idea. So we got to the dorm, and the older girls were getting ready. We're all getting our jammies on. We've gone by the concession stand, had our food, and we're looking out the window, and the big girls go, hey, come here. They're like 15, 16, 17. Come here, Claudette. Look, what? We go over, and there's a big, huge moon right on the horizon, but it's a Mississippi harvest moon, we used to call it. It's sort of yellowish, orangey, getting darker by the minute tangerine on the way to red. <sighs> Look, the moon is turning to blood and what he preached has come true, Claudette. We have all indeed missed the rapture. I am going crazy. I have never been crazier in my life. I am absolutely terrified. I'm shaking. I'm 11 years old, having, I believe, a nervous breakdown. I'm, if you can have one at 11, I'm going crazy. So the counselor comes in, and she's tying her rope. She's, all right, what's going on in here? Well, the big girls had to confess. Well, we told the little ones the Lord had come. And, well, he didn't come. I'm here, aren't I? And I remember thinking, I don't know if she'd make it. She's so grouchy. So besides fear, I had a problem of judgmental, critical spirit. So she... All the other kids are more sane than me. She calms them all down. Everybody, go to bed. It's time. It's midnight. Go to bed. Everybody go to bed. Except me. There ain't no common Claudette. I am weeping. I am sobbing. I'm getting sick in my stomach. So she says, what will convince you that the rapture is not taking place? If I can just talk to daddy. Now, our camp then, the camp Don and I went to, was in Tupelo. It was in the same town as the mansion was. So daddy lived in town. So she said, okay, I'll go call him, even though it's after midnight. So she puts a dime in the phone. It's this thing that hung on the wall, young people. You put a dime in it and go dingy-lingy, and you can talk to humans, and it's got a cord. But anyway, she put it in, and she, she calls the house, and I'm standing there right by her, and she's calling midnight in Tupelo. I'm 65 next Saturday, 50 every many years ago. Ring, 
Ring, ring, ring, ring. About the fifth ring, I'm like sick as a dog. And all over her house shoes, I'm puking up my hot dog. I'm puking up my potato chips and my brownie and my Coke. And she's going, stop it, kid. Stop it, kid. She was so mad at me. So she calms me down. She finally goes, look, just you're losing it here. Please tell me where could your daddy be? The rapture, I promise you, is not taking place, sister. Where could he be? <laughs> and I thought of the name of this one diner that was open after midnight. And she called him. And sure enough, daddy was there talking to some preachers. Hallelujah. She said, Brother Clubber, I cannot calm your child down. She's disturbing the dorm, and I want to go to bed. I'm going to pack her clothes. Would you please come and pick her up? I'll be waiting outside. I got kicked out of my first youth camp on Thursday night because of my stronghold of fear. I was so glad to see him and leave that old grouchy counselor. I tell you, I ain't going nowhere ever again. There's my daddy, and he's my gauge of the rapture's taking place. And grew up and learned some things. Went to ABI, got a degree in theology. Learned a lot of things about the oneness. Learned a lot of things about mighty God in Christ, doctrine, all, all kinds of things. Three years of training six and seven hours a day. It was wonderful. But somehow, in those three years, nobody bothered to teach one class on the amazing grace of God. We just missed it somehow in that generation. I was 26. My husband was associate pastor in Cincinnati, Ohio. Rick Flowers was there preaching. He preached a message on Mephibosheth. And that just touched my heart so much. I'll just read you a little bit here before we go on. Feels good to slow down. I think I'm going to cut all my lessons in half. I talk way too fast anyway. 2 Samuel 9, verse 5. This is when King David wants to show kindness to some of Saul's family, Jonathan's family. He loved Jonathan so much. He sent and he fetches <clears throat> Mephibosheth out of the house of Maker, the son of Amia from Lodibar. Down to verse 7. And David said unto him, now this is Jonathan's son who is a cripple. Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I'm going to restore to you all the land of your father, and you will eat at my table continually. Verse 13, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, even though he was lame in both of his feet. And when Rick Flowers read that, I'd read the Bible through, but that just passed right over me and my trying to get through the Bible reading. I didn't get anything out of it. But that night I got something out of it. I saw a lame boy. I saw a lame boy who had never done anything for the king. He just got born. But because of the king's favor, he said, I want you. I loved your daddy. I love your line and I love you. You come and eat at my table, even though you're lame. You don't deserve any Thing, but I'm going to give you everything. You're going to eat just like I did. And something in my spirit of a 26-year-old lady begin to go, oh, what would that be like? I want that, Lord. I want that. And just a few weeks after Brother Flowers preached, I was rocking in my green rocker where I prayed. It was an old rocker Aunt Beulah gave us. Ancient and ugly, but it was comfy. And I would kneel or rock every day, rather sit in that rocker and pray. And one morning in my prayer time, not that he speaks to me every day because he does not, but that day he did. He said, Claudette, my grace and my completeness, these I am going to teach you. And at first I was like, what? Your grace and your completeness? So I'm honest with him. I said, Lord, I, I'm sorry, but I, I know about that. <laughs> I know about grace. He said, really? What, sweetheart, do you know about grace? Um, it's amazing. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It sounds sweet and it's amazing. I, I know that. He said, what else do you know? I said, uh, let me think. What else do I know? Oh, God, I know something else. Oh, I know. Paul wanted it to be to everybody. Almost every epistle Paul wrote at the end, he would say, grace be to you and grace be to you. I thought it was a salt shaker. And at the end of every epistle, you just had to throw a little grace on. A little grace for you, a little grace for you, a little grace for you. Makes everything taste better. A little grace. He said, do you know anything else? And I said, not really. 
It was the end of the conversation. A year later, I asked the Lord, because it was New Year's, and I always try to gear up for the new year and look back over the old year, as you, we all do spiritually. And I'm saying, Lord, you told me a year ago that you were going to teach me your grace and your completeness. But it's a year later, and I don't know anything more. All I know is that it's amazing that Paul wanted to beat everybody. You haven't taught me one thing. And then the question was, are you willing to suffer? No. -uh. No, 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 no. We, we are not talking about the same, uh, the same uh, class of courses here, Lord. No, no, no. Nobody wants to suffer. No. See, we want to learn about grace and, and completeness and ha, rah, rah, balloon stuff is what I wanted to learn. But because he's God and I know his voice, I said, okay. Let me read this sentence to you. Any foundational change in the structure of your spiritual life will require a pulling up of roots, a major surgery, you'll have to go through recovery, and you will experience relapses. I'm going to read it again. Any foundational change in the structure of your spiritual life, especially when you're dealing with your foundation, and God was about to rip up my foundation, will require pulling up of roots, it'll require major surgery, it'll require recovery, and you will have relapses. And a year later, I was suffering. Not just physically, that was part of it. The greatest suffering was in my spirit, in my mind, in my emotions. won't bore you with the details. But I asked the Lord one day in prayer, Lord, where am I? He said, Claudette, you are languishing on the back doorstep of the palace of my grace. I didn't even know what that word went. I knew it wasn't a good word. If you're languishing somewhere, it sounds sad anyway. I looked it up in Webster. It means to lose vigor or vitality, to become weak of active force, to live under distressing conditions, to become slack or dull, to suffer with longing for something. And then I tell you this not because I was spiritual. I tell you this because God gave it to me because I was desperate. When you are desperate enough and you need an answer from God, God will paint a picture on the wall if he has to. He will put a video on your dining room wall. He did for me. And the reason I'm telling you all these years later this story is not because I can't think of anything new to say. It's because I've never told this story here at this conference. And the Lord told me years ago, Claudette, that vision was not just for you. That vision was for my daughters. Until the day you die, I want you to proclaim it because I want my daughters to live in where I'm telling you to live in in this vision. So listen up. It wasn't just for Sister Walker. It was for you. In this vision, I had a baby on my back. I had a newborn baby who will be 30. Lord, help me. How old is the child? Seven. I think he'll be 37 Monday. And I had Jonathan in a papoose thing like on my back. And I was leaning inside of a screen door. There was a hole in the screen door. I was leaning inside the screen door. I was so weak. I literally could not get up. But I could tell it was a kitchen by the smells. And I was thinking, oh, if I would just have the strength to crawl in here and get a bite to eat, I could go back to work. That was my idea. And right behind this building, to the far right in the back, was a field. And people were out there with hoes. They were working really, really hard. And I realized and saw at the edge of the field that I had dropped my hoe to come in and try to get something to eat. And I walked over there. And then I had strength in my vision. I began to stand up. And I went over and looked. And when I got to the field, I stood there longing to go back to work. The Lord spoke to me in the vision and said, Claudette, you have been raised your entire life in this field. And all you've ever had to eat is the toil of your own hands. But you are not a hired servant. You are a princess. You're an heir to everything I have. You're an heir to everything that I am. And I'm like, what? You know, visions, things change quickly. And all of a sudden, instead of a baby on my back, he's a little boy, about three. And I'm holding his hand. And we're walking along the side of this building. And I don't even know where I'm going. But it's a huge building. And when I get out front and look, it was the most beautiful building I've ever seen in my life. It was pure white marble, pure stark white. And there were steps going up about this long and about that high, but you could climb forever because the ascent was so gradual. And I took my little boy and we started walking up that, we started walking up and I said, Lord, where is this? He said, Claudette, this, my dear, is the palace of my grace. 
And when I got to the atrium, it blew my mind. I tell you, I'd never seen food like that food. It was good housekeeping, squared, and all those fancy Bon Appetit magazines and stuff. I've never seen food like this. There were tables everywhere, and they were piled with the most lush and beautiful food, and I was starving to death. And the Lord said, pull up a chair. I want you to eat here for the rest of your life. And I'm like, Lord, but what the deal? What the deal? I'm supposed to. He said, no, I want you to sit here, and I want you to eat continually at my table. And my dream of Mephibosheth had come true. And the Lord said, you're never going to be able to earn this. You're never going to be able to work your way into it. You just come here because I have favored you. Because I have called you. You belong here, Claudette. You see, however, the robe of a servant, he has to earn it. He's got to work really hard to get that robe. And when he gets it, it's coarse and it's scratchy. It's burlap looking stuff. You've got a crazy old rope around the middle and, and just sandals that aren't comfortable and but a, a queen a princess oh wow we dress in velvet we've custom made we have people to hang our clothes up in the closet and and I'm like whoa wow god this is incredible where in the world is this going to lead me lord what's going to happen i didn't know but i knew that the lord had spoken to me and I knew that he was calling me to a new place in his spirit. I knew he was ripping up a foundation that had been ever so carefully built by Satan in my life that caused me to live in fear in my relationship with God. I read somewhere that truth usually lies right in the middle of two very angry ideas. Somebody's over here trying to prove their case. Somebody's over here. And truth generally is right there in the middle. You think about it. Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He just kept walking in his truth. Essence that he was right down the middle of his life. Doing what was true. Speaking what was true. Being true. The crazy Pharisees are over here going. Nyang, 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 nyang. Sadducees over here going. Nyang, 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 nyang. You know, everybody's always mad and trying to get him to join their camp. But he won't join anybody's camp. Because he is the camp. And he's in the middle just walking forward in absolute truth. And in this discrepancy of thinking and, and a thought process that had been fostered in my spirit and in my mind from a child, I told you my God was a terrible taskmaster. He had a, he had a club in his hand. He was just waiting for me to do something. And pow, he was going to get me. I exaggerated, Sister Walker. No, I thought about that. I thought about that a lot. I thought God was always going to beat me up. At the same time, the Lord gave me this vision. Don't have time to go into all of it, but the first National Youth Congress was in 1979. I taught a lesson on depression. My husband taught on prayer. We had breakout sessions, whatever. But when we came back in from the breakout sessions to the main auditorium, there was a powerful move of the Spirit, and several of our elders had preached that afternoon. And I was just so troubled about all this in my mind. It's one thing to have this great vision, Christy. It's like, whoa, wow. Well, <laughs> but I get up in the morning, and what's different in my life? How am I going to move different? How am I going to think different? How am I going to change? How am I going to go from being what I was to being what you're asking me to be? I didn't have a clue. It's like going to a college and signing up for a course. And you see at the end, you'll we'll have learned all this stuff. And you're like, whoa. You know, say it's in uh, Egyptian. And you can't speak one word of Egyptian. You know, but they're telling you at the end, you're really going to get this. And you're like, what? You, know, you get up the next day, and you don't know how to say hi in Egypt. Yeah, I mean, Egyptian. You don't know anything, you know. So it was like God was showing me a course he wanted to take me on. But I had no idea how to get there. No idea whatsoever. So at the same time that I'm looking for the way... To live in that palace and pull my little self up to that wonderful food and throw away that creepy old robe I'd worn my whole life and get my new velvet gown on. And I was really hoping a part of the plan would be lying in the chase lounge. I did. I thought I could just imagine the chase lounge and servants. I used to be one, but the servants would pop the grapes in my mouth and fan me with the big fans. And I'm like, whew, this palace stuff is for me. Hallelujah. You know, but somehow that didn't seem right either. So I wasn't sure what was true, Sister Marlene. I didn't know. At the same time, I'm seeking God. My husband and I are fasting and praying. Okay, you've told us this, but what do we do now? Help. Had some friends come by. My husband had gone to Bible college with them. Hottest singing group in the UPC. Shouldn't say hottest, should say most anointed singing group in the UPC at that time. Forgive me. They were anointed. They were, they were, they were powerful. The one girl, the lead singer who came to my house that day, I've rarely heard a human sing with more anointing. When she would sing, she's dead. She's going to be with the Lord now. You thought the skin was going to come off of your body. 
the Sister Sandy, you'll, you'll wave me. It's 11. Is it time? Okay, just stop me. So we're going to finish this afternoon. She would sing with such anointing and authority. It was two sisters and a brother. <clears throat> Incredible things would happen when she sang. Thursday was our fast day. We didn't just have a casual relationship. We liked boys and had fun and all that, each other's weddings and stuff. But I mean, we, we fasted every Thursday. And we would lay on her mom's trailer floor when my father was president at Gateway College and seek God. We were close in the spirit. We talked about the kingdom. We talked about the work of God. We talked about our dreams for the kingdom. And this is the kind of relationship she and I and her husband and Marvin had. And so she knocks on the door. And when she knocks on the door, here we've been seeking God about grace and asking God, show us what you're talking about. Open the door. And I went, <gasps> Because I hadn't seen her in over a year. And her hair was up to here. The hair that used to squish her ankles. She had makeup on. Come on in. And I went to the bathroom to cry. God, what in the world has happened to them? So we come back to the table. We're going to be kind. We're not going to address it. It's their problem, not mine. So we're just talking about the little boy, their little children, blah, blah, blah. The weather, you know, what do you talk about? And all of a sudden, her husband's like, well, we know you and Claudette. We've heard she said this vision and that you guys are studying about grace. Marvin said, yes, we are. We're intensively studying the word about grace right now. I said, well, we just want to let you know we found it. We have arrived. <laughs> that was what their spirits were saying. We've arrived. Then they got up on their soapbox, which is where they all preach, is from their soapbox, and began to talk down to us. And instruct us how we were in B word, bond, bondage. They were free. Telling us about all the carnal things they were doing now and the worldly pleasures they were participating in. And the whole thing spirals down to such carnality that I'm getting sick at my stomach. And I'm thinking, if that's grace, I ain't taking the course, God. I'm sorry, but I, if you sent them by to inform me, well, we knew he hadn't. So my husband simply said, well, you know what? I love you. He, he traveled. He and this man traveled and sang in a trio for Gateway. He said, I've always loved you. I always will. But we're on such different pages. What I found so far of my study of the grace of God is nowhere near where you guys are living and what you're doing. And I'm very sorry we have this disagreement. I will always love you, but I will never agree with you. And they left and we saw them precious few times after that. God is not that org in the sky. God does not have a hammer. He's not just hoping you'll mess up and knock you. That's a satanic lie from hell. But neither, everybody say neither. neither. Is he a jolly old grandpa who's gone senile and his grandkids can kick him in the shin and sin doesn't matter to him anymore and he just loves everybody. Do whatever you want. God doesn't care. He's just a senile old grandpa in the sky. He's changed his mind about what he said in this book. Are you kidding me? That too is a lie from hell. Sin is sin. It's always been sin. God is a holy God. God wants us to live holy, act holy, write holy, be holy. So here we are in the middle. God, teach us. So I'm sitting there. I told my husband, I'm not leaving this auditorium. I'm seated thousands, just going back to the room. I'll come there when I get there. I gotta know. I gotta have something, God. I've gotta know what to do next. I hear them. I don't believe that. And yet I don't want to be what I used to be. I don't know how to get to where that palace thing you showed me was so pretty, God. But I don't, how does it affect my everyday life, my thoughts, my attitudes, my spirits? Because visions are no good unless they're enacted in your life. Unless you can think like the vision so wants you to think. Unless you can act like the vision wants you to think. Visions are just useless. You gotta work them out in your life. And I said, God, show me, show me, show me, show me. And I just sat there in utter silence for a long time. But I'd made the vow. I ain't leaving here till I hear something. And I guess he figured I'd get pretty hungry in a few days. So in his mercy, <laughs> he said, go home. Yes. <laughs> and study the life of Prince Charles. Huh? I mean, this is pre-die. Nobody knew who Charles was. Nobody cared. He's some kid in England going to college who has a big nose. That's all I know. And who cares? <laughs> but the Lord said, go home and study his life. This is a good breaking point, Sister Sandy. Should I? Five after or no? 
Okay. We'll do five after. We'll eat lunch, and I'll tell you what I learned about Prince Charles after lunch. Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I know this is deep stuff. God bless you. light, O oh God, and be refreshed in knowing, O oh God, and hold our heads up high and go about our business, Lord, as the daughters, God, the princesses that we are, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hug somebody, tell them how pretty they are and how much you love them, and you may be seated. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When I was talking to you before about how my God was terrible taskmaster, hard to please, only all A's were good enough for him, how that was stupid, not the truth. And we got jolly Jesus over here who's senile, old, sin doesn't matter, all the stuff that used to matter to him doesn't matter anymore, and let's just all love Jesus and baptize however you want, speak in tongues or not, he doesn't really care, all that wacko stuff that some that have left us are saying, and truth is somewhere in the middle. What I was seeking for, I didn't know it in that analogy that I just gave you, but what I was seeking for was truth, and truth is always in the middle. So as I said in that huge auditorium in Memphis, Tennessee, the first National Youth Congress in 1979, I'm very old, um, and the Lord spoke to me, go home and study the life of Prince Charles. I knew that I was going to learn. He was going to give me a path, a pattern. I'm a visual learner. If you'll give me something I can see, I can get it, and so God knew that. So he was going to give me a structure around which to begin to teach me from Romans, from Hebrews, from Galatians. I remember I asked the Lord one day, I was crying like dumb, dumb here. I'm like, God, you keep telling me this great stuff. Where is it? And he's like, Romans, Hebrews, and Galatians. Oh, really? You know? So anyway, duh. You know, so I did an intensive study of that, but still didn't understand a whole lot. And so God gave me something around which I could frame the truths of his word and put it together in a way that I could experientially, and you can hopefully experientially, and I'm not going to say anything revelatory, you know all this, but we're just going to remind ourselves today of who we are because Satan does not want us to know who we are. He does not want us to go about our business with our heads held up high and fire in our heart and glory over us and, and scaring off the devils that he wants us to scare off. Satan doesn't want that. So in any way that he can intimidate us or can cause truth, which is beautiful, but the sweetest graces by the slightest perversion can bear very bitter fruit. So we must constantly and always early this morning at five o'clock, I said, Lord, I have a pair of binoculars here. I'm looking for your word. I'm looking for your uh, vision today for my daughters. I, I'm looking to you, Lord Jesus. But if in some way, because the last week I've been uh, struggling physically and whatever, and in my sickness and in my weakness of body and my brain not working too well this week, Lord, in some way, if, if that is skewed a little bit, then just fix the binoculars. You know how it is binoculars? You're looking for some eagle out in the wherever and you're on vacation. All of a sudden somebody goes, just twist it and go, oh, wow. You know, it was there all along. You just need a little tweaking. That's what I felt in the Holy Ghost, that somebody here today, maybe it just be one body. It might be Sister Walker. You may have to have endured this whole thing so I can get my binoculars fixed today. But anyway, if it's me, I thank God for letting me teach myself because I want to look clearly, Donna. I want to see him as he really is. I want to see myself the way I am. I want to see you the way you are. I don't want to believe lies about you. I want to know the truth about you. This is a day of doctrine. You heard me preach at Michigan 
ladies retreat a couple years ago. It's a day of doctrines of devils, deceiving spirits, and the spirit of antichrist. We're not magnifying those demons. That's just facts. It's where we are. But it is also a day of truth. It is a day when the truth is shining brighter than it has ever shown. And for those who want truth, who refuse to walk away from truth, God's truth is going to be eliminated to Claudette Walker, old lady that I am, in a way like I've never seen it before, because that's what I want. And I know you want it, or you wouldn't have given up a whole weekend here to come and seek the Lord with fellow sisters. Excuse me. But in that, you can have the proverbial, even in your knowledge of God or your knowledge of yourself, you can have the emphasis on the wrong syllable. One little accent mark. Emphasis on the wrong syllable when you thought I was talking in tongues. <laughs> but if I put the accent emphasis on the right syllable, you know what I said. We've got to keep the emphasis on the right syllable. It's Satan's desire to let me put the emphasis on the wrong syllable and get me all messed up in my head and off on some rabbit trail down some crazy old whatever and end up in deception. I don't want to go there. I want the light of truth right in the middle, shining bright. I want to see. And when my binoculars get off, God sent a preacher to me to correct me. God sent a child to me to correct me if need be. I don't care who corrects me. As long as somebody's walking in God, let him walking up and say, you know what, Sister Walker, I really think whatever. And I'll get down and humble myself before that child. You really think so? You think God told you that? Honey, let me write that down. And I'll pray about it if it's just a little kid. But I've had God talk to me through little kids before. I want to be corrected. I want to see right. I want my binoculars to be true and to be right. So, God, good that he is. I go home from that convention. And the mail, because we've been gone quite a while. The mail's piled up, you know. Bills and advertising. Very few love letters in there every now and then. But, you know. So digging through. Junk, throw away. Junk, throw away. Junk, throw away. Junk, throw away. A lot of junk, throw away. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I start to pitch this one because it's wanting me to buy some books. And I've got plenty of books to read, and I don't need any more books to read, thank you. But I thought, oh, well, just flip through. Whoa. Hello. There's a picture of Prince Charles with the big nose thingy. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. And a book that had just come out. H.R.H., the man Charles who will be king. Buy it. Got it. <laughs> Fill out my little deal. No computers then. No fancy phones and whatever. <laughs> Fill out my deal. Comes in the mail a few weeks later. I devour that book. I read that book. I've read that book more than I've read any other books. I've read other books on Prince Charles more than ever. I just, everything I got. And I got it with my Bible on one side of me and the Prince Charles thing in the middle and an empty notebook right in the middle because I knew I had just signed up for a class to find out how to live right there in the middle, how to see God, how to see myself, how God was trying to teach me how to experientially live in the palace of grace. And I couldn't wait. The first thing I learned about Prince Charles is he's rich. <laughs> Duh. Over 14 million a year in his own pocket. Probably gone up since I read that book. His family owns over 250,000 acres of land. I just poured water on my notes. I baptized my notes. They have palaces. They have trains. He doesn't ride a train. He owns the train. They have planes. They have limousines. They have Mercedes. It is insane. Queen Elizabeth and her kids are so stinking filthy rich. It's just nuts. You know how he got rich? Anybody want to guess? He got born. He went. <laughs> and the minute he did that. That very minute. He went. <laughs> he had it all. It was his. Now, he had to learn how to manage it, and he had to grow up, and Mama had to teach him a lot of stuff and whatever, but he didn't have to earn it. He didn't have to do one thing. He just had the right name. He was in the right place at the right time, born to the right family. I'm talking to a bunch of other people who probably tried to pay your bills every month like I do. So I doubt if there's anybody in here very rich. If you are, please see me. I need a loan. Uh, however, in the ways that really count, sweetheart, you are looking at, sister, so rich. 
oh my goodness. I am looking at the wealthiest women in this city. I am looking at some of the wealthiest women in the world, not in natural things, which won't matter the minute the rapture takes place anyway, but in things that are account for eternity. Let me just name a few. Don't get me going. I could teach two hours on all this. I'm just going to try to skim over them. Number one, the gifts of the Spirit. We have access to nine incredible gifts of the Spirit. We have supernatural gifts like discerning of Spirit, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. There are billionaires that pay all kinds of money. To go to psychics and try to find what in the world is going to happen in their life. And inside of you resides the power of the Holy Ghost. And at any moment in time, God can just, boom, you just know something. There's no way you can know it. And you just know it. You can discern a spirit. You can give forth. You can speak. You walk in realms that this world wishes so bad they could walk in. You've got supernatural things like faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles. It does not just say for Lee Stone King, and God bless him, I love him to death, but it is not just to say for Lee, uh, what's his other name? Kleindance, who's my friend. It is not just say for these powerful prophets and God bless them and all they do. If I read my book right, it said you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what I choose to believe, that in my hands there's healing, in my hands there's power, in my hands in your hands everybody look at your hands Say, these are holy hands. These are healing hands. I need to use them. You need to go into hospitals. You need to go in the gas station. If somebody looks like they thought they had a headache last year, now I ask them if they're feeling bad. I'm just waiting on them to frown because I'm trying to get a prayer in there. Are you feeling okay? Well, who feels okay all the time? If you're over 40, nobody. So, you know, I just ask them and they're like, well, you know, I do have this ache in the back of my leg. And I said, well, you know what? We believe in divine healing. Would you just let me right now lay my hands on you and pray? I believe God wants to touch you and just pray right there in the gas station, pray in the parking lot, pray everywhere, lay hands on everything. You never know what's going to happen. We got to get Jesus out of the church. You got to take him out where we go because we have powerful, rich gifts of healing inside of us. Got those speaking gifts. The tongue stuff that sounds weird to the world. But at any moment, we can break forth in tongues. And then we can hear the interpretation. Do you understand? The interpretation of the divine tongue coming from Almighty God. A message from heaven to earth that my ears and my spirit can hear. People, you talk about rich. Oh my goodness. Presidents of nations would give up half of their wealth if they could just have contact with something like that and be involved in something so powerful as that. They can prophesy. Everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the future. And we can go in meetings and someone can stand up and just begin to give forth a word of utterance. And we can write it down and put it down in your book. It will happen. It may not happen in my lifetime. I told him on my tombstone I want you to put. She still believed it. It may happen after I'm dead. It doesn't matter when it happens. I'm going to die believing the promises of God. I don't have to see them. To make them true. They're going to happen Donna. I hope we get to see it in our lifetime baby. But if we don't. I want to go out in faith. Saying this world is going to have the greatest revival. That it's ever had. More people are going to be saved. Than have ever been saved. The church is going to shine brighter. In this evil day. Than it has ever shown before. We're going to see more signs. More wonders. More miracles. You don't want to check out now. You don't want to back up now. You don't want to drink some Kool-Aid version. Of this thing. Don't put any poison in the Kool-Aid. I got to hurry. See, I told you. I get in this and I get excited. And I don't get the other four pages none. Number two, we got the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, Lord. If I had time to tell you. My people know they could tell you more than they're kind. So they won't. It's pastor appreciation. They wrote us the sweetest cards. They're so precious. And I'm like, oh, my God. Help me to live up to that. Jesus, they surely don't think that's who I am. Because you and I both know. My God. I am German. I'm choleric. I'm melancholy. I'm a, I'm a mess. Don't tell me to sit down. So are you. The Bible says in our flesh dwells no good thing. There's nobody good in here. If there's any good in anybody, it's Jesus. But I don't just have that stupid old German choleric, stubborn, all that stuff. I have to fast away all the time. That's not just all who Claudette Walker is. Inside of me, I have fruit of an incredible 
powerful spirit like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Any given day you meet me, I can let the me out of me. And if I let the me out of me, you better get out of the way because you don't want to meet the me that is in me. But all I can choose through fasting and prayer and obedience to the word to let the fruit of his spirit come out of me. And I can literally be God's personality to this world. I can let God out of me. I can let the personality of the Lord Jesus Christ who walked among this earth. And people can so want to be with me because when they're with me, they feel like, oh my God, what is this? Well, it ain't this, but they're feeling Jesus and they're hearing Jesus. That should be the goal of every Christian that I want to talk for you. I want to speak for you. I want them to hear you when they see me. That's just not for preachers. It's the goal of every one of us every day of our lives. Anybody feeling richer? You got the gifts. You got the fruit. Furthermore, we're in war, but we have powerful armor. I've got the helmet of salvation. I've got the breastplate of righteousness. My loins are girt with truth. My feet are shod with the gospel of peace. I have a shield of faith wherewith I can quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. In this hand, I've got the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it'll cut through every bastion of hell. It is true when nobody believes it's true. It is true when the whole world turns away. It is true. And it is my sword. And I've got seven powerful weapons when I'm under attack of the enemy. I've got the blood of Jesus, the word of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus. I've got angels up here around me today and so do you. I've got the word of my testimony. I've got prayer with praise. If I counted right, that's 32. That's just 32 things I named right there that we have that we are so incredibly rich. Don, I don't think I've had a chance to tell you since this happened last year. I had to go to the bathroom. I was in Tupelo visiting our fo my folks. And I went in the nearest bathroom, which turned out to be the Elvis Presley Memorial, whatever thing. So the lady's trying to get me to take the tour. And I'm like, yeah, I grew up here. I don't, I'm not into Elvis. And I got to go get my folks. And she said, so what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor's wife. She said, well, you might want to visit the church that Elvis went to when he was a little boy. They've moved it now here on campus in mine. No kidding, because I knew what it was. It's a tongue-talking church. <laughs> Trinity, Church of God, tongue-talking. I'm like, how long does this tour take? She goes, 15 minutes. So they even show a film. They reenact a service of what it would have been like when Elvis was. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> I go sit down. There's only one couple in the back. Seats about 60 people. Only one couple in the back. The lady's waiting on the time. I'm like, huh. Can I play the piano? I can't really play the piano. But anyway, the lady goes, yeah, thank you. I go up and I'm just sitting there, Donna. I cannot tell you what came over me, honey. Thinking how did this, because you've heard my story, my 14, 15, 16 year old, yeah, I wish I could cut my hair, blah, 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 rebellion phase. And I'm sitting there and I'm remembering, I went to school with Presley's, went to school with a lot of his cousins. And I'm talking about how they used to have service till midnight. And he would talk in tongues and be lost in the spirit. How his mom was a holy woman. And a picture of her there with her long dress and her long hair. And holy woman of God. Until he was 13, he was raised in that holy atmosphere. And so I'm singing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. And I'm sobbing by now. I'm just crying. And the lady's like, excuse me, it's time to start the film. I'm like, <laughs> so I go in the back and I sit down and I watch this service of these old time Pentecostals. And I watch them with their long hair and I watch them with their long whatever. And I talk about how they prophesied and how they had tongues and interpretation. And this weird stuff happened. And how this boy from the time he was born till he was 13. And his greatest desire was to be a gospel singer until for a job they moved to Memphis. And then the bright lights begin to draw and pull away thinking, why? Why me? Why? Why did I get it? And he lost it. Why? And I'm so overwhelmed with this the gratitude to God for saving me from the love of this world. And I walked outside and I walked right into a statue. It was this high. It was the teenage Elvis. And he had his guitar slung over him. He was 13 and he was walking toward Memphis, which is where his fame began. I'm standing there. I'm standing from the statue and I'm crying. Oh, God. Oh, God. Man taps me on the shoulder, said, I know you. I said, oh, excuse me. I said, uh, I'm Claudette Walker. Do I know you? He said, no, I don't know your name. He said, uh, I know you in the spirit. You have the Holy Ghost, don't you? 
I said, yes, I do. He said, so do I. And he had tears in his eyes. We're both standing there looking at the statue. He said, one of my dearest friends was very, very close to Elvis. And Elvis summons him to his house just a few weeks before he died. This man's friend. And this drug-induced state said to him, you know what? I would give every penny of this fortune and every bit of my fame if just one more time I could go back to that little church and feel what I used to feel in Tupelo, Mississippi. I was packing to fly to London, England to do the British Isles Ladies Conference. My husband came upstairs and said, honey, I just heard on the radio, Princess Di was just killed in a car wreck. I'm flying to London. I'm like, wow. I was beginning to pray for the family. Did the conference in London, went up to Scotland to minister with Sister Kelly. And then I had a, a day. It was by now a good five days probably after the funeral by the time I got back to London. But I'd stayed an extra day just so I could go visit her palace. I just felt drawn. I wanted to go there. I wanted to see what all the papers were showing. No lie, and I'm tall. We're talking her front yard. <laughs> it's like a park. You can barely see the mansion. It, it's huge. Flowers to my shoulder. To my shoulder. And five days after a funeral, these upper uh, British, uh, who are not moved by much, uh, I looked, old women, little children, teenagers, are standing there after the funeral, five days, weeping, looking at where Di used to live. I had a paper I'd bought on this side of the street. I was just flipping through it. I came across a story where one of her servants had written that the last few months Di was alive. Often, she would awaken this servant in the middle of the night and say, you know, she was already divorced by then from Charles. I know it's late, and I know I've awakened you several times this week, but I really need somebody to talk to. I am so lonely. Would you please come and just sit in my room and let's talk? And I would just pour her heart out. This princess who was beautiful that the world adored died so lonely. We are so rich. We are rich in the fellowship of God. We are rich. We are not alone. We have the body. We have each other. We have people who truly love us. I see some of you once a year. Oh, Sister Walker, so good to see you. And Ah, that connection in the spirit. That connection in the spirit is what this world is longing for. We are so rich in fellowship. We are so rich in love. We are so rich in camaraderie. And we need to cherish that and not let the enemy do anything to destroy the unity of the church. It is a priceless treasure. Second thing I learned about Prince Charles is that, you know, my idea that I was hoping I'd be on that chase lounge and they'd pop the grapes in and fan me. That's what I really hoped a princess meant because I was tired. I'm like, oh, that'd be good. I just <clears throat> sing and sweat and get fanned. No. The book says, by virtue of his birth, Prince Charles enjoys colossal advantages and privileges scarcely dreamed of by any ordinary mortal. But from his birth, this prince has worn shackles which most people would never endure. Privileges beyond advantage. But he had to have such a restrained life because of who he is. This is not me out hoeing in the field to earn favor and food, but sitting with the king in the throne room every day under daily instruction. Charles is in, in contact to this day with his mother every single day of his life. If they're out of country, anywhere, he has to be caught up because any minute, mama may die. Now, Charles has been in this training. I believe he's my husband's age. I think he's 67 now. He's a few years older than me. He has been doing all this rigorous training of how to be the king of England, but it's all such an iffy proposition. If mama dies, he might reign over one nation and one small world in one of God's many universes for just a few years because he's got one foot on the grave and the other on a banana peel at this time by himself. He's done all this his entire life for such an iffy kind of future. Me, you, 
Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there. For the Lord God giveth the light. And they, say me, and you, are going to reign forever and forever. If Charles had to go through an entire lifetime of training to maybe sort of he might do something. If he dies first, he'll never get to do it. Then who am I to think my training should not be a little rigorous? That I shouldn't have to walk a little different than this world? That I shouldn't have to have instruction from God? That he should not train me and teach me and jerk my neck when I'm wrong? Because this is not iffy. Claudette Walker, Princess Claudette, is most definitely, any minute from now, along with you, going to begin to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, forever and forever. Forever, forever, and forever. We're not just going to sit around eating grapes, honey. You know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be judging angels. Dear God, I don't even know what that means, but that's what the word says. I tell you that we're going to be doing such big stuff. Whoa, and Brother Norris is right. He taught me that we can just be up there in the New Jerusalem and we can just whoop, blink an eye and boom, be back down here on the righteous new earth. That sounds cool to me. I hope he's right. It sounds fun anyway. But I do know that we're going to have a body likened unto his own glorious body and that we are going to be counselors with him, that we are going to help rule this earth and the millennium. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. It could start this afternoon. So don't let anybody tell you this training is just so loosey-goosey. God don't care about much. Oh, yes, he cares about his kingdom. And he cares about how it's going to be reigned. And he cares about who's going to reign with him. So we can't be lazy. We've got to be very disciplined. We've got to go to school. We've got to learn. We've got to study. We've got to memorize. We've got to incorporate it. We've got to live it. We've got to eat it. We've got to sleep it. We've got to know it. Not just preachers. Everybody. This is our training manual. Number three, I found out that his lifestyle was very highly prescribed. We're going to talk about his teenage years. Other princes, it said, have sometimes seemed to disdain the idea of service. But Charles has a genuine sense of noblesse oblige. That's French, which means an obligation of honorable generous, responsible behavior that's fitting to one of such high rank or birth. Let me read it again. He feels like he has an obligation of honorable, generous, and responsible behavior that's fitting to one of his high rank or his high birth. His lifestyle is highly prescribed. Number one, he dresses weird. He has one valet when he goes out in his, on his royal duties just to make sure that one of his 22 or 3 uniforms is pressed exactly right, has the right braid at the right place, has the right button at the right place, has the right epaulet at the right place, has the right medal at the right place. I mean, nobody else has to dress that weird. Just Charles. But there's a reason he dresses so weird and stands out in the crowd. He gonna be the king. I'm sure he doesn't resent having to do that because he's got all the benefits that go with it. He walks in a room, a baby, they know who he is. Number two is hair. His boyfriends back in the 60s had ponytails. Because it was the drug generation. A lot of them had ponytails to their waist. He never had a ponytail. His mama told him, sorry, Charles. I know that's what all your buddies do. I know that's what's cool in your world. But you are not like any other boy on this island. You alone are going to be the king of England. And go get a haircut, Charles. His speech, he was not allowed to hang out at the local pub and cuss like everybody else. The places he goes were highly prescribed by his mom. When he was a teenager. Reminds me of something in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16. 7, one. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Hereby say I'm the temple of the living God. Whoa. That still just blows my mind. I will, 59 years on December the 6th, I will have had the Holy Ghost. And it just blows my mind that he's still in there. I would have left me so long ago. But I am still the temple of the living God. Why he wants to stay in here, I'm like, oh. I would be, I'm out of here. I'm going to go find somebody else who's doing a little better than Claudette. 
But I'm still the temple of the living God. I will dwell in them and I will walk with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Wherefore, since he gave us all these promises in verse 16, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and my daughters, says God Almighty. Verse 7, which we know there was no delineation of verses and whatever when this was written. It was just a long letter he wrote to the Corinthians. But chapter 7, verse 1, one says, having then therefore these promises from the last three or four verses, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Everybody say, and of the spirit. And of the spirit. Perfecting holiness in the eyes of God. God's people have always been set apart. They've always been peculiar. They've always been consecrated in thought, in word, in attitude, in deed, in action, and yes, in dress. You could just always pick them out. It was God's plan. And I, for one, am glad to hold my head up high. I was on a plane not well several years ago going down south. And I sat down and, and, and this guy, you know, you can't always recognize them necessarily unless... Some weird things, you know, other are going on, but they're, they're just normally dressed. And so I said hi to him, sat down, got up my Bible, began to study to preach in Texas. He looks at me and he goes, hi. I said, hello. He said, you're apostolic, aren't you? And I put my biggest smile on and I said, yes, I am. And how did you know? Because <laughs> I knew he was an ex. He had to have been an ex. <laughs> well, my, my pastor's wife used to dress like you. That's, that's why I know. And when he said, used to, a sword went through my gut. And I said, young man, I am so glad that I have been called and set apart from this world. And I'm glad you could recognize me, not just to be weird and different, but I want to be a bright light shining for the Lord in this world. And thank you for saying I'm apostolic. Yes, I am. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I'm a tongue talker. We baptize in Jesus' name. And we don't look like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't think like the world. We are not a part of the world. We're something different going on here. And I got to witness to him the whole rest of the flight all the way down to Dallas lifestyle is highly prescribed I was studying this again early this morning I use so many Gideon Bibles done and I always go off and forget my little Bible I always carry my big travel Bible but then I don't want to bring it because it's falling apart so I, I mark up Gideon Bible so whoever gets the room after me if they want some key verses they just look for the yellow <laughs> so I just I just yellow it up I'm like yeah you'll know what's important on that page at least to me Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God, that's what we're talking about, amazing grace, remember? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the new Jerusalem. Yeah, but first, in this present world. So the grace of God is a teacher. It's going to teach me something. People who told me Jesus was a jolly grandpa and didn't care about anything anymore. It's going to teach me to deny stuff. To deny ungodliness. To deny worldly lust. It's going to teach me how to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And I am so thankful for the balance of grace and truth. Which is right down the middle of two very angry ideas. Number four. I found out that Charles is obedient. He gives very strict adherence to all of his queen's order. There are in communication every day, he is in a perpetual state of readiness to reign. Everybody say that with me. A perpetual state of readiness to reign. Touch your ears and say, give me ears to hear, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, not long before he left, I have so much more to tell you. But you can't bear it now. Imagine that. He'd spent three and a half years with them visibly. They could see him and interact with him and talk with him. And after all the teaching and everything and exampling he had done, he said, I, I still go, oh, boys, you don't believe how much more I've got to tell you. But I've got to go now and you can't bear it right now anyway. But keep listening. Everybody, keep listening, keep listening, keep listening. Did you know every day God is trying to speak to us through his word? God is trying to speak to us through his spirit. It's not a problem that God is not talking. The problem is Claudette. I'm not always listening, Christy. He's always talking. He's always, if you're a good mama, you're always trying to talk to your darlings and teach them and train them and problem is they don't always listen i want to be the type of daughter i want to be the type of princess who is sitting on the throne the bible doesn't say someday i'll be raised up to heavenly places with christ now physically new jerusalem i understand all that but in my spirit he gave me this little song a couple years ago 
it's to the tune of a Christmas song. My, my people know I don't write songs. I'm not a songwriter. So I borrow other people's songs and change the words. <laughs> so this is a Christmas song. When you're handicapped, you do the best you can. He hath, this is Noel, Christmas song. He hath raised me up to gather with you. You have made me sit down to gather with you. You have given to me joint seating with you. I'm in training to rule and to reign with you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I now, I now, I now. I now sit right beside you, King of Israel. How arrogant, Sister Walker. No, it's scripture. He hath raised us up together with him and made us sit down together with him and has given us joint seating with him in the heavenlies. When I get up now and I do my palace thing, Sister Lori, I don't always think about eating at the table. I do that every day. I try to do it every day of my life in one way or another. Eat at the table. I don't always think about being on the chase lounge with all my little instruments and singing and, and doing whatever to God. And I love to do that too. But you know what I do after I do all that stuff? I march boldly into that throne room and I don't ask him, can I have an audience today? I just walk up beside the throne and take my little seat right beside him and say, what is it I need to learn today, Dad? Because we're going to be ruling and reigning in this world pretty soon. Anything you need to tell me this morning? How do I use this scepter again, God? <laughs> Sister Walker. Don't have time to go here. Work on, pray for me. I'm working on a lesson. I'm working on a message. The Lord spoke to me when I was studying all this recently. He said, you cannot hold the scepter of dominion. As long as you are wielding the whip of self-chastisement. It's a message against the demonic spirit of guilt. Which has far too many Christians, including Sister Walker, often with my negative nature, bound. You cannot hold the scepter of dominion if you've got the whip of self-chastisement and you're beating yourself up. And when I got done with that, he said, and furthermore, it's quite insulting to me. You would beat yourself up when I took quite a beating on my back so you wouldn't have to deal with that demonic spirit. So help me pray about that one. Hallelujah. Let's just pray a minute. Let us see ourselves, Lord, as we are. This is all. We've pushed this all too far off in the future, oh God. We are today in training to rule and reign with you. Today you're giving us a little bit of authority at a time. Today you're giving us a little bit, oh God, of leeway at a time. Today you're saying, okay, now you go down and do this for me. You're sending us as diplomats and ambassadors, oh God, throughout this nation. And you're saying, okay, now you speak. You just sent Lee Stone King to speak of the United Nations to the entire leaders of the world about the Holy Ghost God you are raising us up God you're giving us favor you're giving us favor in this world somebody who's holding that whip right now lay it down in the name of Jesus quit beating yourself up I don't fast enough I don't pray enough I'm not good enough God's mad at me I'm blah 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 all the junk the devil says throw it down in the name of Jesus get up and do the best you can hold your dominion hold your scepter of dominion sit beside your father realize who you are you have a velvet garment on that was custom made you have a scepter in your hand that was purchased at Calvary you have a crown on your head and it's not a crown of thorns. It's a princess crown. We have for, I believe with all of my heart, if all of the apostolic Christians worldwide, one God, apostolic Christians worldwide, and I'm pointing to myself the most of all, if I could ever truly experientially understand who I really am and all of us could together, we could turn this world upside down in no time. I believe that. But it's the enemy's job to keep us sort of foggy well we're going to rule and reign whenever oh no 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 you're sitting there beside him now he's raised us up together with him and made us sit down together with him and given us joint seating in the heavenlies with him that's scripture we need to realize that's who we are number five he has authority it said when he visited yugoslavia they gave him a guest book to sign he could have signed chosen from any one of 12 titles that he has stuff in the navy he could he could have just put a little comma and a little tiny p which stands for princeps in latin but he didn't 
they were eager to see what he'd put in the guest book and, you know, wondering if he'd put all 12 titles. Charles, you know, Prince of... But it didn't take him long to sign, so they couldn't wait till he went away to see what he put, open it up. Guess how he signed the guest book? Not even Prince Charles. Charles. Duh. They knew who he was. He knew who he was. When I sign my checks, I don't write very many. We, Marvin pays most of the stuff online, but every now and then I send a check. Somebody for gift or money or something. So when I sign that check, I don't do it, but I could. I could put Claudette K. Walker, comma, big caps, Jesus Christ. But then they'd send the people from the yee, 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 yee. <laughs> and they'd bring the straight jacket, and I would be witnessing the mental institution, and I don't want to go there yet or ever, <laughs> except to visit people who are bound, so I don't do it. But I know who I am. I know what my last name is. And you know who else knows? What's that? Was there some ad about something when somebody, sh when somebody talks, somebody shakes? Or E.F. Hutton, was it? Somebody help me. I don't know. Anyway, something. Yeah, okay, whatever. Anyway, it, the deal being that, you know, in the world, like, oh, 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 their title of their big company makes everybody tremble. Well, I know who I am. God knows who I am. You know who I believe. I, I just, it's just my pet thing, okay? You can look up verse and whatever later. If you don't find it, come correct me and I'll say, okay, that was just fanciful thinking. But I really believe this. When I sign my name, the world does not tremble. I tremble praying the check won't bounce, Sister Lehman. Don't let it bounce, God. Not really. We try to keep good books. But, but you know who trembles? Every time, I believe that, every time you write your name, hell and all of his henchmen are going, oh, there's another one. Ow! What are we going to do if these people ever realize the power of the name that's been put over their life? What if they start using it? Oh, my goodness. And the devil gets an Excedrin PM headache because he said, all power, Jesus said, in heaven and earth is given unto me. And I have now given you my name. And I'm telling you, go use it. It's your name too. Go use it. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Pray for the sick. Pray for the finances. Touch people. Break demons off of people's lives. Speak the name that is over your life in hell. Praise, praise, praise. Thank you for your name. Thank you for his name. Thank you for the day you were baptized in his name. Thank you that all power in heaven and earth is given under the name that he gave you. Don't you ever say I'm a nobody. Hmm. The king promised Esther, what do you want? Just tell me what you want. Please don't cry. Just tell me what you want. I'll give you up to half of the kingdom. Half of the then known kingdom. Man, that sounds like a pretty good deal. But you know what Jesus is saying to you and I today? It's my good pleasure to give you the kingdom we have it the kingdom of god is righteousness peace and joy in the holy ghost the kingdom is within i have power to rule and reign over demonic spirits i have power to rule and reign over claudette's stinking spirit when it gets out of control and i have power furthermore darling if you get out of control to put my finger right in your face and preach you a pastor's wife message and declare bondage that has been over your life broken and I've seen demons leave off of young people. So have you, Donna. So have you, Sister Lehman. You've seen demons leave and people start to think right and whatever. We need now, if you love your devil, I will never be able to get rid of it. 
Somebody's got to make a conscious decision. I want this thing off of me. But if you want your devil off of you, everybody at your table can pray and say in the name of Jesus, spirit of depression, spirit of fear, spirit of torment, spirit of self-pity, be gone in Jesus' name. And it has to go. It has to go. It has to go. Number six, I found out that Charles serves. His motto is, Ich Dean. I don't know if he still wears it. I have a picture several years back of him with a small finger on the little finger of his left hand. And on there it says, Ich Dean. It's been the motto of the Prince of Wales for thousands of years. It's on a gold signet ring Charles wears on the little finger of his left hand. And it means, I serve. Charles has said, I don't want just to be a prince. I want to serve my people. To his credit, he's not lazy. I mean, to me, I don't see how much it good, good it does to go around cutting all those ribbons and whatever. And, you know, but, you know, when he shows up, it means a lot to that foundation or that charity. And so, so he works really hard. He doesn't just sit in his palace. He works. He serves his people. He does what he can to help with the environment and whatever in his world of what he understands is service. I said to the Lord, because I'd always worked hard for God, meeting in the palace, I'm following through on what he's teaching me over this next course of five or six year study that Pastor and I were on, and learning, but I said to the Lord one day, what, what about the field? I had this sort of attachment, you know, to the field. My identity was out there. I hoed in the field. I worked in the field. I earned my keep. It made me feel good about myself. I did this and I did that and I did the other and bless God I'm so worn out and everybody feels sorry for me. A little self twisted in there every now and then. But you know, I, I, I wanted to work for God. Donna, I don't know if you remember this, sweetheart. Sorry, these things. It must be a Donna and Claudia thing somewhere in my brain when I see you. Boom, up comes another memory. But we used to have these sleepover things, you know, and we'd laugh and play all night. And we'd be silly and all you have to do is be with Donna and you're going to have fun, even when she was a kid. But one night, I remember we started talking. We were like 15, 16. I started talking about the future and the things of God. We sit by my little attic bedroom there at the mansion property. And I remember Donna, we just looked at each other and said, I don't know, I don't know what God wants me to do, but I just wanted to use me, Donna. I mean, she started crying. I do too, Claudia. I don't care what he does. I just want to be used. We're sitting there on the floor of my bedroom, both together singing, to be used of God, to speak, to sing, to pray. To be used of God to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of his consuming power. To be used of God is my desire. And sometimes when I go back to people, I'm thinking, what, what, what the deal, God? You heard the cry of two crazy little old girls just trying to find their way. If you want to be used of God, God will use you, but he will not abuse you. And what Satan wants to do is take it us being used of God, twist it, once again, put the emphasis on the wrong syllable and make you think the only way you're pleasing to God is if you are living on the edge of burnout. That is a lie. That is not what God said. So I asked the Lord, I had to know about the field because my identity was back there. I said, Lord, what about the field? I lived there so many years. I've always worked there. He said, I want you to go back to the field. I'm like, okay, get my hoe, ready to go. He said, no, 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 no. I want you to go back to that field, Claudia. All throughout your life, you'll be sharing this vision. And I want you to walk back to the field. And I want you to extend invitations to others to come and live in my palace of grace. And tell them that they too are princesses. That they do not have to earn my favor. They don't have to earn their keep. They just have to listen to my voice and follow me. Do what I say when I say how I do it. That is how a servant is pleasing to his master. You think about it. If I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Then I've got to do what he says to do. When he says to do it. How he says to do it. For as long as he says to do it. And all with a good attitude. But he's a good master. And he will not abuse us. Number seven, last thing I'm going to share with you about Charles. I found out he is so rare. R-A-R-E. A real crown prince is a rare breed. There are fewer crown princes than hooping cranes or bingle tigers. One of this crowd, I call it the Jolly Jesus Church, said to me, you know, Claudette, if we are so right, or if you're so right, then why are we so small 
in number. I didn't say it because it would be disrespectful because she's older than I. I just kept my mouth shut. But my brain was going, I don't know. You might want to talk to Noah and his seven family members as they're closing the door to the ark who are the only people saved on the entire earth. I really don't know. I'm sure they were hoping the ark was more full, but there were only seven of them, eight counting Noah. You might want to ask Gideon, who had plenty of soldiers to fight the battle, but God said, I've got to reduce this crowd. I've got to get it down to people who are full of faith, to people who will not, when the victory is won, say, we did it, to people who are going to say, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, and God pared it down, pared it down, pared it down, till he had 300 that were pure of spirit, a remnant, Lori, pure of spirit and ready to go, that he could trust with this power, because they would no, I'm all, no, 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 it's all to him, it's all him, it's all of him, through him, by him, and for him. I I don't know. You might want to talk to Jesus, lady. Who said in Matthew 7, 14. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life. And few there be who find it. And I'm not up here applauding and hurrying small numbers. We're all praying for revival. We do all we can to reach everybody. But you got to read the book as it is. The entire world is not going to be saved. And not everybody is willing to pay the price. And this watered down Christianity, where carnality rules, where the word of God is no longer the inherent word of God, where we just come to church to watch a show and just to be made to feel good and whatever and go back home and pat our carnal selves on the back. That is so against the word of God. That is so against everything in this holy book. And we need to know and understand and realize that an apostolic Christian is a rare breed in this world. And you need to hold your head up high. Not in, oh God, there's just a few of us. Thank God I'm one of them. And I'm trying to get everybody else to be one of them. I am so rare. I am so precious to God. I am so loved of God. I am so favored of God. Why me? Out of billions in the world. Why would I know this truth? Why would God bless us in such a powerful way? I saw in prayer one day a beautiful picture of the grace of God. It was in a huge red box. Bright red foil. It had a big gold bow, and there's still a price tag on it, dollar sign. I knew the gift was the grace of God, so I wanted to see what it cost, because I couldn't read from there. And I got up closer in the vision, and there's a sign, which I knew meant the cost. And it said, nothing and everything. That's what this amazing grace will cost you. Initially, absolutely nothing. Not enough days you could fast. I could fast myself so skinny I could get those clothes in my closet that I think that someday I'm going to be able to wear again. I could pray. I could pray so many hours. I could invite everybody in my town to church. I could do so many good works and good deeds. Would that have earned one drop of his pure and precious blood that he shed for me? No, a thousand times no. However, if I perceive love like that, if I perceive the grace of God like that, and realize that the definition of of grace is this. I'll say this a couple times because the Lord dictated this to me and it took me a year or so to swallow it. So I'll say it for you a couple times. Grace is the process. Everybody say process. Through which his righteousness is accrued or given, assigned, accrued to me because of his shed blood. I'll say it again if you're taking notes. Grace is the process through which his righteousness is accrued to me because of his shed blood. It'd be easy for you to do it now if God is pulling on your heart. There's somebody here, like I said, it may be only one person, but God's wanting somebody to get this in your spirit. If, if, if you know God is talking to you and you've been a little whacked like Sister Walker Rose, maybe I mean, it's totally whacked, but on one side or the other, you're, you're not exactly in that middle where everything's clear and true. When the Lord gave me that definition, I went and I got my Bible and I got a green notebook, still got it. I looked up every verse on grace and wrote them out by hand. Every verse on righteousness, wrote it out by hand. Every verse on the blood of Jesus, not the blood of bullocks and all that in the Old Testament, but the blood of Jesus, wrote it out by hand. 
took me over a year because I didn't just write it. I would intensively study it and pray for it and ask God to get it in my spirit. When I got done with that study, it'd be so easy for you now. You can go to a computer and stuff come flying out of the thing and whatever. It took me a long time to write that by hand. But I would suggest some of it that you would write by hand because there's something about when you're bearing down with that pen and you're putting something in your spirit. Get it on your refrigerator. Get it on your steering wheel. Get it in your heart. The ones that really mean a lot to you, memorize it. We were blessed to go to China three times in the last few years and minister to the underground church there. We may not always have this. I did a ladies meeting in a, a sky rise in Shanghai, like 30 something uh, stories up in the air. And these women had come, some of them two and three hours, walked and rode buses and rode trains to come and hear the word of God. And most of them did not have their own Bible. They would have a few pages and share with each other and whatever. We, I hope we'll always have it. I hope Brother Norris is right. I hope we're out of here before the tribulation. But I don't know what's going to happen. And you better love enough of this that you get some of it in your heart. You better start memorizing some of it. You better get it so down deep in your heart that when the trials come out of your mouth, starts coming the word of God. Where you just don't have to flip and try to find it. Oh my God, where was that? It's right here. It's right here. It's in my mind. It's in my heart. It's coming out of my mouth. Because when the trials come and when they hit, we've got to have the word very, very close. The word of faith, the Bible says, is nigh us, even in our mouth and even in our heart. I don't know why the Lord just told me to quote this verse, so I will. It's from Isaiah. I would be a terrible Bible quizzer because I don't know where things are. I do know this is in Isaiah, but don't ask me where. You can look it up later. <laughs> My husband led quizzing for 20 years, and his wife can't remember anything but Psalms 23, 1, as far as references, so... I tell the quizzers, you can do it. You kids are smart. You can do it. Go for it, kids. I'm like, oh, I don't know where <laughs> they can do it, but I can't. But anyway, I can memorize some of it. Here's one of them from Isaiah. Who art thou that fearest a man that shall die or the son of a man that's going to be made like grass and as forgettest the Lord, thy maker, who is stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth and you have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy and where is the fury of the oppressor now that's a good one to memorize for when the devil's coming after you you can speak to those spirits of fear and say back who do you think you are i know the god who stretched toward the heavens i know god who laid the foundation of the earth this little problem i'm having right now is not even a mountain it's a molehill in the name of jesus be gone and until the mountain moves just sing dance wait in faith wait in hope don't let satan steal your joy don't let him steal your victory don't let him steal your praise and if he has and he gets mine for a few days every now and then, I always tell him, when I get up and get my voice and my song and my praise back on, you're going to be sorry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's clap. I got one more story and I'm out of here. And I told you the Lord dictated that definition to me. If grace is the process through which his righteousness is accrued to me because of his shed blood. It took me about a year and a half to chew that their steak up. It was a good steak. Changed my life. Literally changed my life. The Lord ripped up foundations in me that were wrong, Sister Lehman. And he planted his word inside the foundation of my life. But once again, he does know how I learn best. Give me a picture. I'm a visual learner, so he did. It was two years from the vision, and I had been studying intensively the Word of God. Romans, Galatians, Hebrews in particular. All the books on Prince Charles. I was getting it, but it wasn't really sealed in my spirit. It was still a work in progress. The Doug Davis trio used to travel back then, and they had come to our church in Cincinnati. And he was the best man at my husband's wedding. They're dear friends, so they were staying at our house. So I had been... Cleaning, cooking, washing, ironing, you know what you do for company, feeding them. And uh, we had to come to church early. They were doing sound check in the auditorium. So for the first time, literally, in a couple days, I was able to sit down, whew, catch my breath. So I sat down in the church office and looked down at the calendar. I had no idea what day it was. Looked down, and the date said December the 6th, 1980. Like December the 6th. Wow! Oh my goodness. I said, Rocky. He was one of the pastors on staff. He's walking. I said, Rocky. He goes, what? I'm like, 
today's my birthday. He said, well, Sister Walker, I'm sorry we missed it. Happy birthday. I said, no, 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 no not my natural birthday. It's my spiritual birthday, Brother Rocky. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. I said, I've had the Holy Ghost 24 years today. I got it when I was six and I'm 30. 24 years I've had the Holy Ghost. He goes, well, happy birthday. Like, Thank you. So I'm like, thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. You know? So when I get in church, I'm really happy because, you know, it's my spiritual birthday. It's cool. And in the church we ran at that time, they had carpet down the aisles and up front. But underneath the seats, they had linoleum, the kind, the squares like that you, it's on concrete and you can glue them down. It's cheap. So anyway... That's all we could afford at the time. We kept it clean. Um, they're singing their hot new song. Doug had just written it. And everybody's singing it. My little two-year-old boy. My miracle boys. They're playing on the floor. I'm clapping, singing. They're singing, he's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back for me. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back for me. And the Holy Ghost interrupted my worship and my singing and said, Claudette, yes, Lord. Something about getting your nose in this book hours a day. Everybody wants to hear the voice of God. You fall in love with this book and learn how he thinks in these 66 letters and what he feels and whatever that channel you're wanting to hear from God. It began to be more open. He's like, I said, yes, Lord. I heard him. <laughs> Do you understand what you're singing? For me, he's coming back for me yeah says so, lord some songs are like really deep and, you know you gotta get out your dictionary and you gotta travail to get the revelation but this one is just sort of out there you know he's coming back he's coming back he's coming back for me he's coming back, coming back, he's coming back for me yeah i get it he said no you don't you never have what? into studying working my god Look at your boy. It's my two-year-old boy. Had a hypoplastic wound. Should never have had a child. Carried him three weeks past the due date. Written up in Jewish hospital as a miracle. Risked my life to have him. Was told at any time the wound would burst, I would die and he would die. Walked the floors and travail at night. Believing for a miracle. Said, if your boy there is out in the backyard and he got all muddy. And you and Marvin were going on a trip, a vacation, say. If you went out and looked and he was all messed up, would you clean him up and take him with you on vacation? Or would you just leave him there? I'm thinking, you don't say it, but I'm thinking the questions are getting dumber. <laughs> she would never insult the intelligence of God. So I said, no, I wouldn't leave him. God, you and I both know. <laughs> People beg me to abort this child. No, that's my flesh and my flesh, bone of my bone. That's a miracle. I pray. That's my baby. He belongs to me. I would never, ever leave him in the backyard. I would clean him up and I would take him with me, put him on my hip and we would go. I said, now do you understand the song? I am, he said real loud. Coming back for you. You thought all your life you were just hoping you were barely going to make it in, sweetheart, by the hair of your little Pentecostal chinny chin chin. You thought you were the aggressive part of the equation, but you have no idea how much I love you. You have no idea what a treasure you are to me. I gave my life for you. You are bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. And when I come back, Claudette, you are going to make the rapture. And I went crazy. I started dancing and screaming and jumping and bucking and snorting. I absolutely had a Holy Ghost fit for a long time after nobody was moved about anything. The whole church is sitting there. And I'm... They're all waiting for me to stop so they could do their next song. But they don't know what just happened to me. I just had a revelation in my spirit that I was going to make the rapture. That I want to walk with God and he's going to see to it. He's going to help me. There's no way I can miss it if I just keep trying. After church, for the Rocky who had wished me happy birthday when I wasn't beating up the floor came to me. He was the janitor too. He said, Sister Walker, we all really 
appreciated and were blessed by your exuberance tonight in worship. <laughs> However, I would like for you to come with me. Four of the tiles were gone. I had beat them to death. I had loosened the glue from the concrete and they were scattered all over the floor. He said, now, don't get me wrong. We're not asking you in any way to quell your worship. We just wonder before you start your Indian war dance, could you please just move out in the aisle? But we feel the carpet will be a lot safer place for you to do that. I won't have to glue the carpet back down the way I'm going to have to glue this floor back down. I said, oh, Rocky, but you don't understand. I just got a revelation tonight. God just put something in my spirit. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to make the rapture, Rocky. I don't have to wonder anymore. I'm going to be safe. His grace is amazing. Oh, my God, Rocky, it's so amazing. Stand with me. Stand with me in closing one last verse. And we're going to praise God. I'll turn it over to Sister Lehman. And now my favorite verse in the New Testament is. In the epistles anyway is this. Jude 24. Now unto him. Who is able. To keep me. I personalize it. From falling. And to present me. Faultless. Before the presence of his glory. With exceeding great joy. That image I had of him leaning over the balcony going, well, should we let her in, Angel? I don't know. You know she messes up all the time. You taught her that. Then she blew it again. And I, Should we or should we? I'm not sure. We could let her in. Maybe just let her hang by the pearly gates. And if she messes up, we'll kick her out. I'm not sure. Don't let her sing in the choir for sure. Because she'll be an embarrassment. And you know, all those things I thought they used to talk about. I realize now that my heavenly father is standing there with exceeding great joy. Waiting to welcome me in. Say, come on, darling. You're mine. Blood of my blood. Flesh of my flesh flesh, bone of my bones. I love you. My grace has covered your ascent. My grace covers your ascent. If you love him and thank him for that, raise your hands and praise him. We don't have to have a song, just thank him. Thank you for his amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Oh, Sister Donna, could you humor me? Is Donna still back there? Come up here, Donna. Lead us in amazing grace. Just a time or two before Sister Lehman takes it. I love to hear her sing. Don't get to hear her sing much anymore. I just want to lift that anthem. I don't know about a lot of songs in heaven, but I think this is going to be one of them. It's just my personal deal. It's just got to be one of them. It's just so good. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We're going to be saved by the amazing 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 grace of God um, amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I was was lost but now I'm found as blind but now I see let's do it again amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we know less days to see. God's prayer.
face. And when we first begun, let's love the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah! Hallelujah, Jesus! Claudette, uh, I was thinking God has kept us for 50 years. Hallelujah, that 15-year-old when we sat down and said, God, I don't have a clue what tomorrow holds, but oh, Jesus, please. And 50 years later, she and I both, hallelujah, hallelujah, God's kept you, God's kept you, hallelujah, hallelujah, let's thank God. Hallelujah, by birth the grace of God. Hallelujah, we've been kept by His power, by His glory, by His presence. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Woo, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, He's kept us, He's kept us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we have so much to be thankful for. We should have been crazy. We should have lost our minds. We should have been dead. That should have happened. That could have happened. But by the grace, by the love, by the mercy of God, we're standing here today with the power of the Almighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give God thanks. Let's thank God for his keeping, keeping power over us. Hallelujah. 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 Woo. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. There's something in the spirit just for a moment. We don't want to get out. Reach out to someone beside you and t just pray. For Let me tell you, there's the greatest honor in the world to the kingdom of God is that you're here. That you're standing. That you're still, the, when we've done all to stand, stand. You're still standing. Reach out to someone right now. Oh, thank God that your sister, that your family, that you are there beside each other. Hallelujah, God kept them. God healed them. God's going to keep them. Hallelujah. That's right. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, that's right. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. The keeping power of God. Oh. Hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, the body has shut the other Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Ya dala Maria shada ela ba 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 ya dala Maria shada ela ba 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 ya shada ela ba 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 ya shada ela ba 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 ya shada ela ba 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 ya shada ela ba ba Hallelujah, 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 that's right. Alabababadia Shaday on a Bokoya, Babadibadia Shaday on a Bakay on a Bokai. Yadabadia Shaday on a Swedish. Alabadia Shaday on a Bahai. Hallelujah. Ya dala Maria shada ya la baka ya shada ya la baka ya la Maria shada ya. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, just a few more minutes. <laughs> let, let God do and finish what he's wanting to do. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Something Sister Walker said, Claudette, I thought was so good. At the very end, she said, uh, I wrote it down. Uh, God is the aggressor in the equation. That meant all of it. All of it was tremendous, but that ministered. I mean, the, all of it was ministered. I was right. No, so, but he is the aggressor of the equation. So many times in our situations, we feel like it's, it's taking beyond our strength to try to fix what needs to be fixed. And then you have an almost like a subpar diminished spirit that I'm the one that's got to lift this. I'm the one that's got to, I've got to do all of the lifting. <sighs> I've got a breath of fresh air today. <sighs> He's the aggressor of the equation. Oh, thank you. You're the one. Oh, good. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're, you, it's you that's got it all in control. You're the aggressor. Hallelujah. I'm just tagging on. I'm on the, I'm, I'm, uh, just li lift me up and let me just get on your back and you go forward. And I'm, I'm behind you. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, oh, that, that meant more to me than anything. I'm making a plaque in my office. He's the aggressor of the equation. Oh, it's all in him. It's all in him. He's got it all in control.